Okay, we're going to talk about higher order derivatives now. So first of all, what is a derivative? It's, it's a function that gives you uh, the ability to find the slope at a point or the instantaneous rate of change at a point. The first derivative of a function is called the first order derivative. Okay, it's the first derivative. So higher order derivatives means we're going to be taking the derivative in succession multiple times. And each time we're going to be talking about the rate of change of the previous function. Okay? And we've already kind of been exposed to this. Uh, the position function of an object falling near the Earth uh, or anywhere could be called S of T. It doesn't have to be a falling object. It could be a particle moving on a line. Its rate of change instantaneously is called velocity. And, of course, we know how to find it now. It is, it is the derivative of S. So S prime is equal to V of T, where V is velocity. And notice because it's V of T, that means instantaneous velocity. Plug in a single time value and find its velocity at that moment. That's what Galileo was working towards and couldn't get. So if we look at the rate of change of velocity, that's V prime, we get acceleration. Now, it turns out that acceleration, of course, then would be the what? How do we read that? Second derivative, or S double prime, of position. So that would be a second order derivative. We could keep going if we wanted to. We could take the derivative of the second derivative and get the third derivative. We can take the fourth derivative by taking the derivative of the third derivative. So these have to be normally taken in succession, one after the other. And every time you do that, you're talking about the previous function's rate of change. So the velocity is the rate of change of position, and the acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. And what did we call the instantaneous rate of change of acceleration last time we looked at it? Not the twitch, <laughs> the jerk. Yeah, remember that? Oh. The jerk. How about, remember the jerk? Yeah. Hey, I have rhythm. You have seen it, Steve Martin? Okay. It's a good movie. All right, so anyway, here is some of the notation for uh, the derivative. The first derivative, of course, if we're starting with just y equals is y prime. If we're starting with f, it's f prime. dy dx is Leibniz notation. And uh, it would be d dx, the verb, of our function f of x. So let's go down this column here. Second derivative, y double prime. Third derivative, y triple prime, right? Now, once we do that, these are tick marks. They're not Roman numerals. So it would start getting a little bit difficult to discern by a quick glance how many tick marks we had, right? And if you look over here, you already have how many people voting for this guy? Four, and, and Leslie, nope, five. five. Now, I guess you could block chunks of five with that diagonal, but we decided not to do that. So after the triple prime, we denote the derivative by using an Arabic number that's written kind of like an exponent, but we put it in parentheses. And the reason we do that is because this would be the fourth derivative. And without that, if you just say y to the fourth, let's say of x, that is the same as y of x, the function, raised to the fourth power. So the parentheses set it off from, from being an exponent. And then we just stick with it. The fifth derivative would be y to the fifth power. So that's what we do with the prime notation. And it works similarly with f, which is why another reason Leibniz notation, I think, is preferable. So y prime, of course, is dy dx. But y double prime in Leibniz notation is this right here. And it looks kind of funny at first glance, doesn't it? Looks like it's broken. D squared Y over DX squared. D squared Y. So we go, first of all, we go straight to the Arabic numbers. No hash marks, right? Thick marks. Um, and we don't need parentheses because this is, this is exclusively derivative notation. So why do you think these squares are offset? The third derivative would be D cubed Y over DX cubed. The fourth derivative would be D4 Y over DX to the fourth. Here's why. This is the noun, right? The derivative of Y with respect to X. The way that you go from one derivative to the next is you take the derivative of the previous derivative. So let's do that. The verb then would be ddx. Remember that? The verb, take the derivative of what follows with respect to x. So if I take the derivative of the first derivative, which is dy dx, I read this as the derivative of dy dx with respect to x. Look what happens here. If you kind of just go straight across, how many d's do you have? Two, so we kind of write it like that, d squared, 1y, and then the dx, remember, we treat as an individual quantity. So I have dx kind of looking like times dx, and that would be dx quantity squared like that. But the only thing is we assume dx is a single variable like we would delta x, so we don't need parentheses. So that's why it looks like that. 
And again, if you were to take the derivative of the second derivative, it would be the derivative with respect to x of this, and you'd have three d's and uh, three dx's. Okay? So that's why it's offset like that. But Leibniz notation is nice because you don't need uh, the parentheses. You're starting with Arabic numbers from the beginning. Okay, so let's try it out. Example eight. If y equals that cubic polynomial, find this. What does that mean? The fifth derivative. The fifth derivative. We don't have to like put this whole thing in parentheses and raise it to the fifth power and foil it out, right? That would be a very undesirable thing for us. But the fifth derivative, I think, is easy, right? Now, is there a way to go straight to the fifth derivative from the original function? Which you could think of the original function as being the zeroth derivative, if you really want to think about it. Can we go straight from there to there? Not necessarily. Typically, it's a recursive operation, we say, which means you have to have the previous to get the subsequent. So I have to go straight from y to y prime, or dy dx. I'm going to practice both notations. So there's the left side. None of the terms on the right need a rewriting. Did you notice that? They're all ready to go. So what becomes of the first term? Or what's the derivative going to be? 3x squared minus 10x plus 6. Okay, so the derivative of a cubic is a quadratic. Is that surprising? Nah, because every time you take the derivative, you lose one degree unit. <clears throat> All right, so the second derivative, that would be y double prime, and Leibniz notation would be d squared y over dx squared. And that would be the derivative, then, of the first derivative, which is what? 6x minus 10, yeah. So if you're talking about, like, kinematic equations, y would be your position, y prime would be your velocity, and y double prime would be your acceleration. Y triple prime. Well, hang on. I'm still doing the left side. The notation, notation. It's cumbersome, tedious, and perhaps sometimes a burden, but it's easy to leave off and lose points, but it's also easy to write it down and gain the points. Okay, so now would you say six? That's the derivative, yeah. So we get six. And now the fourth derivative, that's going to be one, two, three, four tick marks, yeah? No, no, no. Arabic in parentheses. So the fourth derivative, and you don't really even need of x or d4y over dx4, that works nicely. What's the derivative of 6? Zero. zero. The rate of change of a constant is zero because constants don't change. Now, what did, what's the fifth derivative going to be? Zero. What's the sixth derivative? Yeah. What's the derivative for everything after the fourth or everything after the third derivative? Zero. Yeah. Once you hit zero, you get zero forevermore. So now we'll answer the question. So notice that we hit zero for the first time on the fourth derivative, right? And what was the degree of our original polynomial? Three, third degree. So, um, yeah, if a cubic polynomial hit zero on the fourth derivative, let's look at example B. We have f of x equals 32x to the 57th power minus 25x to the 43rd. Plus 11 x to the 25. That's a big polynomial. I fell asleep halfway through. Minus 15 x cubed plus 9 x cubed minus 8. Wow. Yeah, it tells us to find the um, 58th derivative. Now, normally it's a recursive process, so I have to take the first derivative. What's 57 times 32? Big number. And then I'm going to have to do it again. Wow. Wow. There's got to be a better way. Yes, Grant Weston. If the derivative number, which will always be a positive or, or a positive integer, is any number larger than the power of the, ex, of the exponent on the uh, polynomial, then we've hit zero for the first time when it's one greater and zero for anything after that. So yes, you're absolutely correct. So in this case, I'm not going to do the recursive thing because I don't feel like showing off or wasting time. What should the answer be? Zero. Yeah. Good. 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 So sometimes you can pick up on patterns and, and answer things, and, and that's how the problem would be intended to be asked, something like that. What would be the 100th derivative? Zero. Zero. Good. Is there a way to figure out what the 58th derivative would be? Or the 57th, sorry? Yeah, if you wanted the 57th derivative, you could just work on the leading term, because everything else is going to be zero by the time you're done. But you would have to do a lot of multiplication. It would be 32 times 57 times 56, times 54, times 53. That's a big number. Okay. Yeah, you could do 32 
times 57. And, of course, the exclamation point means what? Can we on the center already? Yeah, it, it means factorial. And it's a math symbol that was designed perfectly for things like this. 57 factorial is the same as 57 times 56 factorial. But what's 56 factorial? It's 56 times 55 factorial. Yeah, so that's called a recursive definition. In general, n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 factorial. So basically... 4 factorial would just be 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. You just keep multiplying all the way down until you hit 1. Okay? I spelled 55 wrong? You did. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, yeah, there's a way to do it. That would be the 57th derivative. That's a good question, too. All right. Um, so, anyway, let's, let's keep going. Example 9. You do number 9 and number 10. You do 9 and 10. Do 9 and 10. And then that should take us to uh, lunch. Lunch. Lunchy. Lunchy. Almuerzo. Brunchy. Socolo. Town Square. I was listening. That would be great to put, like, extra credit questions on your test tomorrow from Mr. Stalling's lecture. Yeah. Huh? What? For Mr. Stalling's lecture last Thursday? Stalling. What? Oh, I gave good grades. Yeah. You weren't there? Talking about all the tattoos, um, how people travel. Oh, right. Remember the dog? Remember the dog? Chocolo. Oh, this one I remember doing. Chocolo. You're allowed to do anything as long as you do it correctly. And honestly, with integrity and enthusiasm, sure, go vote. I don't care. It's an informal poll. I'm not going to send the results to Washington or anything. Hmm. Yep. Leslie Note. Is that who you're going with? Who be that? Who be that? That'd be like Parks and Recs. Leslie Note. Coach Pop. Uh, that's Coach Cook. Can we knock back? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, Coach Pop would be good, Joe. Okay. Um, has anyone gotten to the 400th derivative yet? Mitch again. I like it on the back. I <laughs> just saw that. Mitch again. That's good. I like it. Um, certainly, certainly. This crazy person who, der who who made this question up is not expecting you to take the 447th derivative, right? Certainly not. So maybe there's a better way. Can we go? S Why four? Ah, okay. So let, let's let's kind of look at some uh, practice some here. The first derivative, if you want to think about it, that as a one, you certainly can. Of sine of x is cosine of x. And the second derivative um, with respect to x of sine of x is the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine of x. The third derivative with respect to x of sine of x, third, sorry, is the derivative of negative sine of x, which is negative cosine of x. And the fourth derivative with respect to x of sine of x is the derivative of negative cosine, which is sine of x, which was, I'm having a little deja vu now, equal to the first derivative with respect to x. Yeah? So every cycle of 4, I get back to sine of x. Yeah? So just like with imaginary numbers, if you know how many cycles of 4 are in there, you, could, you can kind of get rid of all the full cycles of 4 because it's getting you right back to just the derivative sine of x. So long division works great. 4, 0, bring down the 4. 1, 4, 0, bring down the 7. That's fun. 1, 4, remainder 3. So it goes in 111 full times. So the um, 111th is going to be equivalent to sine of x, right? So the 111th will put us back to here. 
So which one do I need to go to then? One. So the first derivative of that 112th will be cosine. The 113th will be negative sine. And then the next one will be negative cosine. So essentially, all you need to do is whatever the remainder is, that is going to be your new um, derivative number that you're on because the previous 111 gets you back to where you started. So very similar to imaginary numbers, cycles of four. So your remainder becomes your new one. So the answer is negative cosine. Yeah, very good. So that was a little bit easier way. Now notice we did have to start taking some derivatives recursively until we found a pattern. Okay? And of course, sine and cosine do repeat themselves. So with that in mind, do this one. Y'all do this one, I'll do this one. This is now more an exercise in arithmetic. Eight, six, seven, five, three, oh, nine, eight, nine. Eight, six, seven, five, three, oh, nine, eight, nine. Eight, six, seven, five, three, oh. Oops. Who doesn't know that song? Who doesn't know that song? Tommy Tuit sing it. Tommy Two Tone, not to it. Yeah, it's Libby Truitt, Tommy Two Tone. I will. It is one of the biggest one-hit wonders. It's a pretty big, pretty big one-hit wonder. Um, he sang Starry Starry Night too, John McLean. That was a good one. But it was nowhere near as big as American Pie. I like how Amber, yeah. uh, Kirk Alfred played the song. I just asked her if he knows it. Yeah. I love long division. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know. You have to come to the number sense meeting tomorrow to figure that out. Calculator? Uh, yeah, so if I did it right, the remainder is 1, right? Which means that the 8675309th derivative of cosine is equivalent to the first derivative of cosine, which is negative sine. Yeah, so again, the remainder becomes the number of the derivative that you'd have to take. All right, so there is an easy way for sine and cosine powers of 4. Oh, we still got five minutes. That's good. So, um, eight, six, seven, five, three, nine. We'll play during lunch. Yeah, we'll play during lunch. All right. Example ten. Uh, the table above gives values for two differentiable functions and the derivatives at selected values of x. Use the table to evaluate the following. Now, if it says that a function is differentiable, what does that mean exactly? Very good. Yes, it is smoothly connected everywhere. So it does mean that not only do the slopes exist everywhere, it means that it's continuous. I hope they're okay. Remember, differentiability implies continuity. If it's differentiable, it's for sure going to be continuous. Okay, so find h prime of 0 if h of x is equal to f over g. Now, all we're doing on this one is we're doing the same rules from this section, but we're not dealing with actual expressions. We're just dealing with name notation. So... Because h is a quotient of two variable functions, we're going to use the Hody high rule. So here we go, h prime. And you don't even have to put of x if you don't want to on the first one. So it's ho d high minus high d ho all over ho squared, g squared. Bless you. Now, when you go from h to h prime of 0, you do want to show that. So what is h prime of 0? Well, it's going to be g of 0 plus u times f prime of 0 minus f of 0 times g prime of 0 all over g of 0 quantity squared, which is a little bit easier to evaluate. Now, in a free response, can we stop right there? Is that numeric? No. So where, where am I supposed to get these values? From the table. Yeah, okay. So if you need a value for your calculation and it's not on the table, that's a pretty good indication of you being successfully wrong, okay? So g of 0 is what? 5. Yeah, you look for the intersection of g and 0. And then f prime is 0, negative 3. 
I like parentheses here, minus f of 0 to g prime of 0, negative 1, all over g of 0, which is 5, squared. Free response, can we stop there? Yes, that is a free response stop point, but not multiple choice. So now we've got to corral those negatives. Negative 15 plus 2 over 25, and that ends up being negative 13, 25th. So what do we know about that function, whatever it is, at x equals 0? If the derivative is negative, can we say anything about the function? You think it's increasing or decreasing? The function or the y values are decreasing. Good. By negative 13 25th vertical units per one horizontal unit. And then the last one here. If h of x is x f of g, notice I have to use the what rule here? Product. And I have three factors, so I'll have how many terms? Three. So we go one at a time. So x, you go first. Okay. One times f times g. Plus x stands fast times the derivative of f is f prime times g. And then plus x times f times what? g prime. Just go down the line. They each get their own term. And now h prime and negative 1. If you could pull it right out of the table, feel free. 1 is 1. I got it. What's f of negative 1? f of negative 1 is 3. What's g of negative 1? Negative 2. So there's your first term. Bless you. Plus x. Why don't I evaluate x? And negative 1. Good. And then f prime of negative 1. 4. And then g of negative 1. Negative 2. And then plus negative 1 again. Times f of negative 1. 3. Almost there. And then g prime of negative 1. 2. Wow. Okay. So it's not real di difficult. A little bit tedious maybe. It helps to kind of uh, have the chart or the table right in front of you. So free response, you can stop. I'm going to keep going uh, to simplify as you all go to lunch. So have a great lunch. It ended up being, I got uh, negative four. Is that what you all got? Good. Okay. We'll play uh, Tommy Two-Tone now.